Hello one and all and welcome to the Hacker's Lair. My name is Garden Sound and today we're back in full fucking swing, my dudes. Back here talking about those block rocking beats. Today we are going to make a hacker episode. Hacker music, big beats, fat boy slim, crystal method, Columbo, if you're cool. Uh, and I'll be talking more about that later, but right now I want to show you guys something. <sighs> My poor Model T is broken. I don't know what I did to it. Actually, I know exactly what I did to it. I re-racked it like 20 times and twiddled a bunch of the knobs that I shouldn't have done on the back. Let's see if we can fix my big dumb doofus mistake. I'm going to make an episode of how to make today on the episode today. So if this episode comes out, that means, spoiler alert, I did manage to fix this. Because if I can't fix this today, I'm telling this to the camera and to myself for my own benefit. I'm gonna throw this into the ocean and throw away the footage. <laughs> I have fucking had it with this stupid thing. So if this doesn't work, I'm out. Hey, listen. If you like these episodes, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, more episodes are coming. And also share this somewhere. Nothing helps me more than that. If you want to support the channel, I'm no longer doing Patreon. However, you can buy some music. It's on my website. I'll link it down below. Gardner transitioned from Gardner into Captain Tool with his multimeter and his expensive electronic screwdriver and his Mountain Dew. <laughs> Let's see if we can fix this Model D. I am by no means a qualified electronics expert. Do not take my advice as rote, uh, as, 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 uh, don't try this at home. <laughs> User support bulletin. This unit is carefully calibrated at the factory. The performance may change over time. Really? It, it might. Okay. Interesting choice of words. It might, you know. Incorrect calibration or damage to the, uh oh. Small insulated trim pot screwdriver, got one. Small Phillips screwdriver, got one. A flat sheet of cardboard, I don't need it. External MIDI keyboard, uh, I can use a DAW. MIDI cable, got that. Pair of headphones or a sound system, monitor cable, blah, 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 blah. I wish this was bigger. All right, get started. Uh, firmware update is available. Okay. Update. All right, it's updating the fucking firmware. Update successful. Hell yeah, that wasn't hard. Thanks, Behringer. Putting the Model D into pitch CV calibration mode. All right, this is something I don't know how to do. Run MIDI aux on your computer. Ah, hey folks, Gardner from the future here. I just want to do a better job than what Gardner has done so far in explaining what's going on. Because so far, he hasn't explained anything. I hope you appreciate the green screen effect. I'm not very good at it. Anyway, as I'm editing this video, I've written down a few things I'd like to talk about. So what you are currently witnessing right now is my devolution into insanity because of having to tune this synthesizer a few times. The Behringer Model D is notorious, just like its original ancestor, for drifting out of tune every once in a while. Now that's not bad, you can use the front panel knobs, the coarse tuning adjustments, to bring it back into tune throughout the session. I'd say it drifts anywhere from 10 to 15 cents as it heats up. Over the course of 30 minutes, an A440 might turn into an A445 as the instrument heats up. So I always recommend that people who have an analog synth, especially this one, wait about 30 minutes before trying to record anything or have a serious session. Now this wouldn't be such a huge problem if over the course of a year or so it didn't go so drastically out of tune that I have to flip the unit around and go through the tuning procedure. I know how to open up a synthesizer and fix it. I am a veteran at fixing synthesizers. It is not an easy thing to do, but I've been doing it for years, so I'm very comfortable taking apart the synthesizer, turning it around, and then tuning the little knobs in the back with a screwdriver. Any average synthesizer user has probably had to take off the panel and tweak things around before, but this one requires a little bit of extra effort because of how cumbersome it is to both tune the thing and listen to the thing and send it inputs. You're almost battling cables and physical, the sheer physical nature of this synthesizer while you're trying to tune it. It's a very frustrating experience, and I've done it at least five or six times. Now this time was a bit different because it had slipped so far out of tune and I would bumped it around so much in the move from my old house to this house that I had to actually adjust the 
uh, negative 12 volt trim pot, which you shouldn't ever have to do, but I did. Um, I had to adjust the actual CV calibration. What I mean by that is I had to go into Ableton's clip launcher, create a clip with a specific note, and then launch that clip in order to increment or decrement the amount of voltage going to each oscillator individually. What this is doing is sending a MIDI note in, and then I'm telling the synthesizer whether or not the voltage that it's supplying to the oscillator is the correct voltage for that note. This took a while. I mean, really, it did. It took me seven and a half hours to get it in tune this time. That's why you see me screaming the F word later in this episode. Oh, spoiler alert, I'm screaming the F word mad later in this part of the episode. Here's what I'm trying to say. Behringer, I know what the fuck I'm doing, and this was hard. Please make this easier to do on future revisions of your synthesizers, because I really like the way this little stupid thing sounds. I love playing with it. I have always had joy when I get it actually working and in tune and work and, and functioning properly. That it's, it's, it's a drug, really. There's a market for this type of synthesizer, but not if it's going to be this difficult to maintain. And for all the old heads in the comments who are going to go, Oh, we've been having to maintain gear since blah 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 back in the Cold War. Fuck off! It's 2022. We shouldn't be maintaining gear the same way. It's a failure to innovate if we are. Well, back in my day, we used to drink gasoline. Well, back in my day, we didn't have antidepressants. We just shot ourselves. I also want to throw a grain of salt into my own formula here because I'm not making this easy on myself by having such a custom setup. My, my rack is completely custom. I made it myself. It integrates 19-inch standard and Eurorack standard. It could be easier if you're doing this by the book how Behringer recommends that you do it, where you keep it in the little box that it came in. You've got a modular and you're looking at this thing as a module, which is a great module, you're gonna have a hard time. Okay, anyway, back to Gardner fixing things. C-sharp four. C-sharp four. Exits, calibration. So I've played C4. Measure the output voltage. It should read 2.5. Negative 2.5. Negative 2.27. Alright, that's not good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gardner, and I'm fucking stupid. Ableton, for whatever fucking reason, um, <laughs> treats MIDI differently than other stuff. And I wouldn't have known this if I hadn't looked at the terminal screen inside of MIDIOX. Because it said D5, D5, E5, C5, because I'm trying to get the things, the, com and the commands to work. And I said, that's not the note I'm pressing. I'm pressing D4 and E4. And then I was like, hmm, wonder if Ableton has a different definition for what the MIDI note is than what's actually coming out of the device. And wouldn't you know it, that's the case. Thank you. So to the one fucking stupid developer who thought it would be a great idea to use like, I don't know, like integers, you know, like zero, one, two, zero is the first one. It's always zero, fucking developers. And now here we are, just fighting each other. Useless. Both of us. Both of us, just useless. Uh, anyway, let's get back to work. Increment fine this time. I'll do it twice. Hell. Closer. I did about three each, so I can do three of those now. Good news is I'm starting to understand how this circuit works. <laughs> Bump the knob. Bump the knob somehow. Now I've got to tune it again. Fuck! Oh my god. I fucking did it, boy! In tune, boy, fucking son, I did it, motherfuck. Shit balls, it's hot up here. I'm gonna save the rest of this episode for this evening once it cools down a little bit. All right, we're back. That was me ripping a fart 
in A for ass. Okay, so that was annoying and took a long time, a really long time. But now I'm back here after what seems to have been a while because I've changed my shirt. I had to put my kid to bed. Oh, man. It, that was literally like 1 p.m. today when I cut the video off, and now it's like, what What time is it? Jeez. 8.30 p.m. So it's it's been seven and a half hours. All right, now when I say big beats, you might be wondering what I'm talking about. Big beat is an electronic music genre. That you hey, folks. Gardner here again from the future. Same guy. In fact, chronologically, this isn't very many seconds past when I gave the last sign off at the beginning of this episode, but you know, that's just confusing to think about. Anyway, so again, Gardner's doing a poor job here of explaining what Big Beats music is and the impact that it's had on my life. I would like to elaborate, please. Back in 2000, 1999, a little movie came out you might have heard of called The Matrix. I was in middle school, and I thought this was the coolest fucking shit ever. I remember the first time I saw The Matrix, I was sitting up in my room over the garage at my parents' house, eating Applebee's boneless buffalo wings, wearing my pajamas and turning this up on the very small sound system that I had cobbled together from pieces parts that my uncle had disposed of from his previous iterations of sound systems. It was a simpler time. There was just dick all to worry about. Like, Bush hadn't really fucked everything up yet. Like, 9-11 hadn't happened yet. Like, it was just a simpler time. This is before everybody had a cell phone. This is before the internet was a thing that everybody was contending with, at least in South Carolina. Anyway, so back to the Matrix. It had some really iconic music in the soundtrack, like the Chemical Brothers. It was that whole hacker vibe that was kind of in vogue at the time. And it was in video games too, which was a huge part of my life. Jet Set Radio Future, um, Jet Grind Radio, which is eventually was called Jet Set Radio. It was a Dreamcast game, but it released in the North in North America as Jet Grind Radio first. I had rollerblades. I went to the skate park with my rollerblades. And I think about it now, and I talk to my sponsor like, kids used to bully me a lot in middle school and high school. And it's probably because I went to the skate park with my rollerblades, and I would put on my. Walkman and listen to Prodigy and Batboy Slim and all these guys and, and, and Crystal Method and it was just, yeah, it was awesome, man. Me creating this kind of music is pulling those memories out of my ass. Future Gardener signing off. I'll see y'all next video. And then uh, we're just gonna make ourselves a little big beat here. Just like old times. Look at us. You might have noticed I'm not using Ableton. I'm using Bitwig. I'll make a video about that if you want to. Leave me a comment down below. <laughs> Like 115. We'll start there. All right, I'm into that. Fun. All right. First one kind of caught my eye, this one right here. This guy right here. Looks like it's already been looped by Bitwig. Let's just check it and make sure it's right. That sounds pretty good so far. I like the clicks and pops it's got. Let's add another beat, because this is kind of the thing, you just keep adding shit. Back in the day, they just had a bunch of loopers and samplers, like they they didn't have tracks and tracks and tracks like we have in, in our DAWs. You know, they were literally doing this on like an Atari ST. Like some crazy old shit, dude. That's a good one, nice and short. Exact BPM of 120. That's actually pretty dope. It's nice and minimal. We're gonna grab it.
right, so those three we just downloaded. We're going to composite those into making like the best break ever, best fill ever. There's our, there's our cool fill. Cool. Alright, now let's take all this and group it. Call it Big Fill. <laughs> Alright, now let's fucking squeeze it a little bit. Um, I want to get like a Transient Master or something on there. Squeeze it up. this up. Add some like weird reverb to this too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and let's take this uh, track right here and just like uh, we'll print it down real quick. Um, let's see here, and we'll reverse it. Space them out a little bit so it sounds funny. Like this. Nice. No. Alright, we're definitely going to need. To like pump this up a bit, like add some like pump and kind of groove to it. I'm gonna take this uh, ha uh, snare and put it on every two, for sure. Just like just groove it out, you know what I mean? Like just just. That's pretty much what it was. All right, so screw it. We won't use that sample. Let's use something from one of Bill's packs. He's got really good fucking drum samples. Uh, we'll go to Beleagle Sounds, and then into fucking Spectra. Oop, it's not in here. There it is. Alright, Spectra, Audio, Drums, Meat, Kicks. That's a good one. Whoops, that's not what I want.
Ah, oh, yeah, I like where this is going, man. All right, so this is going to be our meat, our meat and potatoes. What was that accent? I don't even know what that was. So our big fill group here, um, I'm going to just grab all this shit uh, and delete it from there and add it to the meat. Cause cool. <laughs> We need a little bit of roads. Maybe I should kick on the fucking roads back there and jam around a little bit. Got it. Sample sorted out here, it might take me a minute. I'm having a really good time with this, I hope you guys are enjoying this too. Nice, yeah, a little fade there on the end. Thanks, Bitwig. What a, what a G. I'm not even gonna quantize it, dude, it's a fucking waste of time. Yeah, do it. That's it. Just, just do it, and then just cut it off. But I want there to be like a dub plate reverb on that. You know what I'm saying? Echo Boy Junior. <laughs> it like instantly works. I like transmitter the best. Let's add some saturation. Yeah, all right, now let's hear it in context. Yeah! I gotta work on that part. Uh, I'll, I'll edit that some other time. We're going to mute that for a minute. It's just going to get shoved to the top of the stack here. Alright. Let's add the second part.
Alright, so this needs to be a little bit more, it needs more character, the, the pitch bends, I'll say, let's call them that. It needs some reverb. It also needs that same effect that the, um, the doo -doo -doo had, the Echo Boy Jr. effect, so let's grab that too. We'll put that before the reverb. It needs less of it though, so we'll mix it out. It needs to have a wider stereo field too. We also need to EQ out the bass. Too much highs, so we'll do a high shelf. We'll bring the highs down a bit. Ah, cool. All these songs do like a big um, change up at some point. All right, now we got to add like some sort of a bass line, like. But an instrument channel. That's the patch I've got on my modular right now. Okay, now it's just the Model D. Recording that son of a bitch. All right, let's do it again.
Jesus Christ. If that's not a fucking advertisement for this stupid instrument, I don't know what is, and that's why I'll never fucking sell this thing. Jesus. <laughs> Alright, so the final bit of this video is just going to be the song over a time lapse. So, hope you enjoy. Thank you for watching. My name's Garden Sound. I had a goddamn blast making this. I'm so excited to be back. Oh, two months sober. What? What? <laughs>